Yeah, okay, well, let me introduce you, uh, Rowan Smith. Uh, she is a collaborator of, of mine. Uh, we are making a project with a student, uh, actually a, an undergrad student. Uh, she, she's from Colombia. And uh, we are uh, already submitted a paper to, to monthly notices. So Rowan uh, made her PhD thesis back in 2006 to 2009 in the University of St. Andrews with Ian Bonnell. Uh, her thesis was about uh, the IMF and massive star formation. And then uh, she made uh, a couple of, uh, of postdocs, one uh, in Heidelberg, well, both in, in Heidelberg. Uh, the first one was about uh, population three stars. Uh, and the second one was about larger scale star formation. And then she moved back to the, to the UK, to the University of Manchester, where she's uh, right now working in. Uh, she, she has this Ernest Ruth for fellowship. So before she starts, let me just comment that last week I was with her former advisor, uh, Ian Bonnell, in a meeting. And um, we were just chatting and, and, and talking. And he told me, you know, Rowan is kind of the best student for managing supervisor uh, that, that I ever had. No? Uh, and, and as a couple of examples that he gave me, uh, it was one of, uh, one of these stories in which uh, Ian wasn't reading uh, one of her her papers, and then she came to his to, to his office, and and uh, and she told her uh, told him, you know, you have to read my paper, and I'm not leaving from this office until you do. <laughs> so that was one of them, and the second one that I also think it's it's, it's a very nice story, is that. Um, Ian at some point came with with such a great idea apparently no so uh, Rowan we have to work on this on this big idea and then uh, Rowan replied well okay um, if you by next week still think that this is a great idea then I may consider it <laughs> so so anyway uh, uh, I was told by Ian that uh, usually uh, he tells uh, his students after Rowan that they have to to do it like like her, no, to 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 push the 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 advisor. So this is also a, a suggestion for for our Mexican students. So okay, Rowan, go ahead. In other words, I was very poly. <laughs> I also used to go at it um, Mr. Early, um before he got in, rearrange his desk so that my paper was in front of his keyboard. So at least he had to move it aside every day before he ignored it. So I would highly recommend that to all students. <laughs> um, but enough of that. Um, so first of all, I'd like to um, thank you very much um, for the invitation um, to all um, today. So what I'm going to be talking about is some work I've been doing um, quite recently, um, a suite of simulations, which I've called the cloud factory. The name of these is to really resolve star formation in its galactic context. And I'll talk about some of the extension that's come on. So just a bit of motivation. Um, one of the things which has always interested me, um, my background is in individual molecular clouds. And one of the things we've re realized over the last decade or so is that these very incredible well, I used to say it turtles all the way down. Well, maybe in our universe, it's elements all the way down. Because when you look, you could see long extended features of hundreds of parsecs, such as the filaments you see, which like the bones in the spiral arms. But then you also see sorts of molecular clouds which are long which have this filamentary um, morphology we have for example the giant molecular filaments identified by Sarah and Berigan in 2014 and then when you move on to that and look inside individual clouds so if we look at Taurus um, for example again you can see these small scale filamentary structures. And of course, this is something that's really been highlighted by Philippe Andre and the Herschel survey. We get these networks of filaments 
which are threading molecular clouds. And the question is, does this actually matter? Um, is there just some sort of pretty thing like fairy lights? Or, or does it actually influence the actual process of star formation? Uh, and I would argue that it does um, for a couple of reasons. Um, the theoretical expectation for how gas fragments is fundamentally different in a cylinder. If you look at some of the, the classical um, work, you know, the isothermal um, fragmentation, um, the Ostricker um, filament. Um, if you look at how you modify that for a magnetic field, you can see that that gives you a different fragmentation. And as you know, Andre has also put out, that might be some way of potentially helping to set the peak of your initial mass function. Um, the other way in which it might contribute to star, and I would argue, is because it facilitates additional accretion onto these stellar objects. So I've just put up here um, some work which I did in 2016, where I took an isolated simulation of a cloud. Um, I identified the filaments in it using the disperse algorithm, which is commonly used um, by observers. And then I overlaid that with the sink particles, which are the non-gaseous particles in my simulation, which I use to represent um, regions of star formation, as is very standard um, in the field. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people um, are very, very familiar um, with that technique. And so what you can see here is that um, the quarters where the and the arrows show where the gas is flowing along these structures. And you can see that it's going along filaments and that this is channeling mass towards the center. And what you find is that if you have a filament, it can feed mass towards the central, more massive objects. And if it isn't above the critical mass um, or collapse or fragmentation, um, that will just act as a channel, as an additional reservoir, which connects that massive core to its environment and allows additional um, accretion. And so this really connects the kind of core scale of star formation to its ambient environment. But the connection doesn't end there because molecular clouds are not isolated objects. They exist within and that galaxy will assemble mass and clouds that increasing their density, making them more molecular, increasing their turbulence. And so all that process determines the internal properties of the clouds. But of course, the stars you form within the clouds then produce ionizing feedback, supernovae, which injects energy back onto the larger scale. And so this process is a coupled one. What I'm trying to do with this work, and other people have been looking at this as well, is to connect the galactic scales right down to the star formation, because it's this large scale gap evolution, which provides the environment in which molecules form and fragment. And this is what's going to be the thing that's setting the internal turbulence. Because in that first simulation I showed you, um, basically a miracle occurred. Um, we took a sphere of gas, we shook it with the theoretical expectation of the turbulent power spectrum you get from observations, and then we saw what happened. The question is, 
is that actually the network the structure you would get within the house if you formed more consistently uh, and so this is the slide i like to put up for that we're trying to move beyond um spare cars into something that's more connected to the actual galactic environment in which it forms um, so i've made some first steps um, at this beforehand. Um, so for example, um, there's a relatively recent um, paper out um, by Catherine Zucker, um, where we used one of my simulations, the first step towards this, this was a large galaxy simulation. We took a region of it. It's without gas cell gravity, so it's quite simple, but it had very detailed chemistry. And so we were able to probe the CO dark gas fraction. Well, because we had this large scale structure, we looked for analog logs um, to large infrared dark clouds um, such as Nessie. And what we found was that actually this large scale structure of spiral arms was a good explanation for why you could get these very long, very dense clouds and that the statistics and number which were formed were quite similar. And when we looked at the properties of these objects, oops, we found that there was a good match um, to giant molecular filaments, so the GMFs of, say, Ruggen and Abru Vincente, um, in terms of the size, um, their width, the length, um, but the positions um, were more consistent with the denser bound objects. And what we basically found is that we could explain half of these clouds. Um, what we couldn't explain was the widths. Our clouds were too large and extended to be like the dense infrared dark clouds. They were very similar to the giant molecular filaments, which were more extended objects. Um, and the big difference we think here is because this first simulation did not include gravitational forces um, for the gas self gravity, only for the galaxy as a whole through an analytical potential. And so if we really want to investigate star formation, then obviously we need to use beyond these simplifications. Okay. And so that's what motivated me to produce these cloud factory simulations. Now, these simulations are run using a modified version of the repo code, which follows the dense gas um, in stellar image and physics. And we have a couple of custom modules, which we've added on top of this. So we have um, time dependent um, chemistry from Simon Glover, um, which is crucial if we want to actually connect our simulations and create later synthetic observations. Um, something I'll get to later. And we assume a uniform interstellar radiation field at the solar version. We've got cosmic rays. And we have obviously differential rotation because we actually have a galaxy. And we have a couple of different ways of doing the um, galactic potential. And the ones I'm going to show you first, we use an analytical potential. And we have gas self gravity and we use um, sink particles to represent the star formation. Now, this is slightly different from some of the other works in the literature where people um, do star formation. Um, normally, you would use zinc particles. Um, so that is a non-gaseous particle, which replaces a region of star formation. When the gas becomes above some density threshold and is unambiguously collapsing, so it's inward velocities, um, and inward accelerations. Um, and then that particle can then accrete additional gas that becomes bound to it. So normally in a galaxy um, simulation, you wouldn't use that. Instead, you would um, use a stochastic star formation recipe where you randomly create some um, stars given a local star formation efficiency and um, related to the free fall time. We don't do that because we want to zoom in to very high dense regions. Uh, and so we want to actually trace where the dense gas is and actually look self consistently at how that um, individually collapses so we can actually trace the formation 
of a mass function and look at how the properties of that relate to the cloud. And we also have um, supernovae feedback, which is tied to our sinks. Okay. Um, as I said, not the only person to do this. I've got a few other people up here, um, notably the Silk Collaboration, um, Greg and Tigris. Um, these aren't your full sim um, galaxy simulations. They are stratified boxes um, with a galactic potential. Um, but there's also work by Claire Dobbs and Anna Duarte Cabral, which does use um, a full galaxy. Okay, so this is what my simulations um, look like. I've got two main um, suites of simulations. The first one um, at the top, the top two panels, um, show a region where we have an analytical galactic potential and we have supernova feedback, which occurs randomly throughout the disk. And so that gives you a kind of isotropic pressure term, um, but it doesn't dominate. We don't have any large clustered supernova feedback on. And in this case, we find that the large scale galaxy um, will dominate. In the bottom, we have a case where we let everything go and we have a strong burst of star formation where the supernova feedback is tied to the sink particles. And this creates big super bubbles, basically, um, as multiple supernovae go off from, from the sink particles and it drives big expansion waves. And so we have here two limiting cases. So this is the more quiescent case, the top one where the potential dominates, and the bottom one is more like a super bubble case. And what we do is we have our galaxy simulation within which there is a box. Um, in this box, the resolution is higher. We go down to a mass resolution of 10 solar masses um, for our fluid elements. And this box co-rotates. And so that already takes you down to subparsec scales quite easily, um, half a parsec or smaller. Um, but we then extract from that individual um, clouds. So I've notified them A and B and as a first step, these were selected to be similar to um, some observations. So A would be a Nessie-like cloud, B would be a kind of Musca-like, which is a smaller quiescent element. And then we have two which are more active, kind of super bubble, post-super bubble um, regions. And within these regions, we further increase the resolution so that we get down to a target mass of a quarter of a solar mass, which equates to a spatial resolution at a number density of 100 of about 0.25 parsecs and a number density of 1,000, which is very typical for these regions, the cell has a radius of 0.1 parsec or smaller. And so we have achieved the resolution within these clouds of being able to identify individual star forming clumps of gas. Um, and this is all embedded within a galaxy simulation. And so we have that memory of the large scale forces. Okay. So let's have a look at um, what the clouds are doing. So A and B here, um, I'll show my, my screen, fantastic. A and B, that's the blue and the yellow one. These are the spiral arms, the kind of potential dominated clouds. And the green and the red are the ones where the feedback was really dominating. And we can see a couple of features. Um, unsurprisingly, the cloud which was in the spiral arm is noticeably denser. That's this blue one. You can see you're getting up to extremely high number densities of 10 to the six. We can also see that the molecular hydrogen fraction, the actual chemical states of the clouds is different. So in the clouds which were formed in this more quiescent state where the galaxy potential was dominating more, we find that the H2 the molecular hydrogen is at higher number densities. In the more feedback dominated regions, there's more H2 at low number densities. However, that's not what you actually observe. When you look at the 
the CO, you can see that's the other way around. And so the structures which were in the potential dominated, they have a greater, um, they have a lower no, um, number density. Whereas the ones which were from the feedback dominated regions, they have a greater CO fraction at high number densities. Uh, and so there's a basically a different chemical balance um, between these two scenarios. In the more feedback dominated case, the density is a bit lower and you have more turbulence, the cloud is more clumpy, more filamentary. And what you find is you have a larger envelope around the outside of um, CO dark H2 um, because the radiation is able to penetrate more easily and disassociate the CO. And so you see more into the center of the clouds in this feedback dominated case, whereas in the large scale forces, the gravitational potential dominated case, what you're mainly seeing is more the outside of the cloud because the self shielding is more efficient. And so already you can see that this galactic environment, you know, just the local feedback conditions in this case, have altered what you see of the cloud and its fundamental properties in terms of its density. Okay. So this is what the actual structures within the clouds look like. I've taken the top one, this is um, one from the spiral arm, spiral arm comes along down here. You can see all the dots where the zinc particles representing um, star formation occur. Um, and this one over here is more from the feedback dominated region. And there's also a second supernova, which occurs from around here. And qualitatively, you can immediately see that there are differences to the internal structure of the cloud. So first of all, if you look at the length of the substructures within the cloud, we can see that the filaments are longer in the potential dominated regions. So up here we have um, length versus velocity gradient. And we can see the really long filaments, the 20 to 40 um, parsec filaments, those all come from the quiescent case. The other thing we can see is that these long filaments are all coherent. They have velocity gradients of less than a kilometer per second per parsec. And this was really consistent with all these long structures. You saw these extremely low velocity gradients. And to be honest, I think this is just a necessary factor of the filament survival. If you have a velocity gradient that is higher than a kilometer per second, any structure that long is going to be very rapidly destroyed. Uh, and so this really came out. And it's something which you do see in the observations quite clearly as well. However, on the short scale, you do see some sometimes some quite high velocity gradients, but it's only in these very short objects, um, which will have a short time scale. The other thing we can look at is the orientation of the filaments. And um, just compare here between the filaments um, and a, a random distribution, what we would expect. And what we find is that when you have large scale forces, and um, in this case, it was our galactic potential, um, this ordered the filaments and we got more parallel filaments than the case where this was randomized um, by the feedback case. I would expect that magnetic fields would probably have a similar effect. And this is something um, which we're looking into. Okay. So that's what the gas looks like. Um, but the question might be, does this matter in any way um, for star formation? Um, personally, um, that's my great interest. And it does, because if you look at the filamentary structures within the different clouds, what we see is that the feedback dominated clouds um, are less susceptible to filament fragmentation. So I show here on the length, the mass to length ratio. So that shows you um, how likely a filament is to collapse. And then of course, if there are any perturbations in that filament, um, that will seed fragmentation as the filament collapses. And I've drawn um, in gray here, the classical isothermal 
um, threshold, which is 16.6 .6 solar masses per parsec. And you can see at this point, all of the filaments which were had this um, less energetic feedback environment, they easily cross this threshold. And so what you get is very rapid fragmentation. So if we look at the spiral arm case, you can see right along the spiral arm, we've had fragmentation and we've formed these kind of big subclusters um, along the arm. And that happens very, very quickly, you know, almost simultaneously and rapidly builds up um, these clusters. Whereas in the case where there was this preceding strong feedback, what we find is that several of the filaments um, never cross this threshold, or if they do, it's in a more distributed um, and sequential way. Um, so it takes, there will be a kind of slower um, evolution um, towards this during, of course, that time radiative feedback could act. And so you get a different history. In the first case, lots and lots of star formation occurs um, before feedback can kick in. And you form these very dense clusters. Whereas in the case where there's been more feedback, um, you think, okay, radiative and feedback from the stars themselves will be more, imp more important. And the clusters which are formed will always be looser um, and more unbound. And something I find quite interesting from the Gaia data is there is the possibility that some of these very long filamentary structures, which we see in these simulations, and might actually be visible in some of the Gaia populations. And what you see is these um, strings of um, stars when you, when you look at the Gaia data. And that could perhaps um, be some evidence of these very long filamentary um, clouds. I think as we're gaining a greater understanding of the 3D structure um, of our galaxy, we begin to see that some of these regions are actually possibly connected. Okay, um, so just a quick I'm advertising sorry. before I move on to, yeah? Can I ask you something? I'm sorry to interrupt of course. you. No worries. In the previous slide that you have, mm -hmm. you have a mass over luminosity. Uh, mass to length. Yeah, so that would mean that you form more massive, uh, more massive clouds when you're in, in the arms, right? Yeah, you do generally. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it makes sense because um, in the, the case where you've had strong feedback, um, yeah. we just showed you that the, the density is, is lower. Um, there's more turbulence um, that um, of course gives you a, a different balance. Um, towards that and the, the actual total mass in the cloud is lower and that is reflected in yeah. the, the mass of the filaments. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. If you are in an environment where you have feedback, then you your interstellar medium, your medium, let's say, is warmer, right? So yeah, that that's would also prevent true. the fragmentation too? Um, not really, um, because there's still sufficient um, mass within the region that the gas can self-shield and so while the average temperature certainly around the outside um, of the clouds will be a little bit higher and when you're in the dense gas um, you're still at sta um, standard um, molecular cloud temperatures and there's no systematic difference between the two regions of, of the actual filament um, temperatures it's uh, 10 kelvin or so no worries Um, so that brings me on to my next point, which is looking at how we can compare these simulations to observations. Now, I mentioned that we have um, a chemical network um, tied within the models. And the reason for that, more than anything else, is because then you can talk to observers and actually test your models and find out all the many ways in which you're wrong. <laughs> because um, all simulations are wrong. The question is only how wrong and can you be usefully wrong? Uh, and that's the point. They're numerical experiments in order to learn about the physics. Um, and so 
in order to do so, you, you need to test them. Um, so we've been doing that. Um, one of the ways we've been doing it is to look at the turbulent properties of our clouds uh, and check how that compares um, with the observations. And to do this, we wanted to do it in a truly kind of observer friendly way. And so we did um, radiative transfer using Lime and Polaris to calculate a 12 CO um, emission. And we used a um, publicly available um, tool, the Turbustat package, which has been used in a lot of um, nearby galaxy surveys to characterize their surveillance um, to perform um, size line width PCA. So this is the relation from higher here in Brunt, um, where along one axis, you have your length scale and along the other, essentially you have the typical velocity dispersion. And so we calculated this um, for our two cases. Um, so we did the one where we had, that's not quite right, um, where we only had diffuse supernova. That's not quite right. I should be um, diffuse, you know, non clustered feedback and clustered feedback. <laughs> okay. Um, and what we found is the case um, with um, the gravity and the no clustered feedback gave a good match to the exponent of the observed scaling law, which you see um, in observations. Um, so if we look here, um, this case here, the red line shows you the observed relation for the size versus line width. And this is where all our points lie. Okay. But what we did find was the match of the exponent is perfect. Um, all we have here is random supernova feedback uh, and gravity, and that can completely con um, explain this exponent. However, in order to get the magnitude of this relationship, you really needed this clustered supernova feedback. And so in this case, we found that the most accurate. And what we were able to do was to plot out our parameter space um, looking at where um, our different simulations lay in this um, scaling, uh, scaling versus the magnitudes of your turbulence. And we could compare um, to the observations and we can look at where different observed regions um, form within it. Um, so this is work done by Andres M. Izquierdo, who is incredibly clever and did a fantastic job with me and um, with this as a, as a master's student and so I'd highly recommend you go um, pick up this paper and you can see the comparison with this parameter space and um, so here we have the classical Larson um, law which is within this region of um, strong feedback and then we can look, we see the Rosette Nebula again, right in the center of this feedback dominated region. But then we get to more quiescent objects, such as the Musca filament I um, said earlier. And you can see this is coming much closer to this region where we don't have strong clustered feedback. And so by looking at observations on this plot, you can get a good picture of the underlying dynamics and what the feedback sources um, might be. Another thing which we've been doing is looking about the H1 for the simulations, because of course, a very important question is looking about how molecular clouds form. And so we've looked at the four H1 survey uh, and compared it um, to ours. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk on this one. This is some recent work I've been doing um, with a new um, student who's been working with me, um, Jiang Shengfeng. And we've been looking at simulating the H1 distribution from our simulations. This just shows a small, small sub-region of one of the simulations in the H1 intensity. I'm comparing that to the 13 CO emission to compare the distribution um, to the Thor survey where a similar um, exercise has been done using a technique called HOGS, which is the histogram of oriented gradients. And that's proposed by um, Juan Soler. 
uh, it's got a nice paper on it in 2019. And basically it uses machine vision to compare two images and um, to see how similar they are. And if you have regions which are very similar, what you get is a diagonal line um, down this space here. Um, so this is the findings from the Thor survey. And then again, you see this gravitation, this um, straight line between the two regions, which is indeed what you see in the simulations. And what this means is that on these scales, the H1 and the 13CO um, are extremely correlated, that they are tracing two distributions. And so you have almost like an H1 envelope surrounding um, these molecular cloud regions. Intriguingly, however, in the Thor survey, there are regions where that breaks down, which might be due to um, internal feedback, um, lines of sight, some other factors. And so with these simulations, we can investigate on which scales you get this good correspondence between the H1 and the CO uh, and compare to the observations to find where that correlation breaks down. Okay, so just in my final um, couple of minutes, I do want to briefly advertise some work by other people who have used the techniques um, um, with me from the Cloud Factory um, to do some things. Um, so, for example, we have some really good work um, by Robin Tress, um, who's just about to defend his thesis in two weeks. So, and then he'll be out into the world. Um, who's been looking at the an M51 analog using the same techniques as the cloud factory simulations. And what he did was he looked at it undergoing a close encounter with a perturber. There's no glass transfer. And what you would expect is you see an M51, all these beautiful spiral arms, and you think, okay, that has to be influencing the star formation in some way, surely. Um, but he did a comparison simulation where you never had those spiral arms. You just had a perturber that um, you had a reference simulation where this close encounter never happened and never triggered this grand design star formation. And um, what you find is that the star formation is almost exactly unchanged, <laughs> which I thought was incredibly interesting because you would have thought that the spiral arms paid a bigger difference, um, but they really didn't. Okay. And this has already had um, some uses because we're able to use these simulations for M51 um, as subgrid models um, for other things. But one of the most um, interesting things that Robin has done with this data is he has this entire galaxy at um, very high resolution um, with chemistry. And he can use this to identify basically an entire molecular cloud catalog of the galaxy. And using this, he can investigate how statistically the cloud masses um, vary in different environments. And again, surprisingly, what we found was that within the disk, whether you're in a spiral arm or not, there was very little um, variation in the cloud mass distribution. The only place that was not true was at the nucleus in the central molecular regions. Here we find that the cloud masses were systematically um, more massive. And something which I think is very interesting is also <laughs> for Javier <laughs> is looking at the, um, the gravitational binding because when looking at these clouds, just using the classical burial theory, I'm sure Javier can tell you more about why that might not be the best um, assumption. Um, what we found was that on large scales, these regions um, were unbound. However, when you looked within them, if you did a dendrogram analysis, you could calculate the binding on different size scales within the cloud, different structures. Um, so this is what we show here. We've taken a, a cloud, we have divided it up, identified dendrograms, and then calculated the classical variable parameter for every level. And what you can see is that while the cloud as a whole is unbound, within individual regions within it, you are bound. 
And as you go down to smaller scales, higher densities, this likelihood of being in a gravitational bound region um, increases. Okay. And so I've got oh one minute to show you the stuff my current PhD stuff's doing, which is looking at star formation in low metallicity dwarfs using the techniques of the cloud factory. Um, we have some very beautiful dwarf galaxies, and he's been looking at them at um, different metallicities. So at 10% of solar and at 1%, and looking at how star formation changes as the metallicity is increased or the UV field and cosmic reionization rate is changed. And looking at the Kennecott Schmidt law, um, which you get from that. And what he found is that when the radiation and the metallicity were scaled proportionally, so we go for the, uh, compared two models, one which had a 10% solar metallicity and one which had a 1% solar metallicity. For the model that had, was 10%, 10%, and the model that was 1%, 1% with respect to the metallicity and the UV field, the star formation rate was absolutely identical, <laughs> which is very surprising because if you look at their morphology, that's this model here, the top left and the top right, you can see they are quite different. And so morphologically, the behavior of these galaxies was very different. Um, but intriguingly, the total star formation within them um, was unchanged. The only thing that changed is where that star formation um, was occurring. We found that the stink particles representing star formation were still mainly formed in the H2 in both these scenarios, um, but not always. And therefore, we look to see what the molecular gas um, Kennecott Schmidt relationship would be. And what we found was that even at these low metallicities, it was approximately linear, almost one to one. Um, but there were some small, moderate variations. And so that paper is going to be um, submitted. Um, it's already submitted. They were just finishing the refereeing process. But that should be in the archives soon and if people are interested and want to know more. And so I think I've used my time. And so I'm just going to finish by giving you a summary, which is to say that we've used a customized um, version of a repo to model the dense interstellar medium on galactic scales. We have shown that galactic environment feedback alters the properties of dense interstellar medium and consequently how it fragments. And this could give you different types of class star clusters being assembled in different environments. Um, we needed both self-gravity and feedback to represent turbulent scaling laws, and we compare, can compare the simulations to observational metrics. And we are now using this setup to probe star formation in different environments. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ron. Thank you very much. Let's see some hands for questions. Oh, we already have one. Uh, Gilberto, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Rowan. It was a very nice talk. I, I enjoyed it a lot. I have a couple of questions. Um, first, you, you find differences in the filaments in uh, potential dominated, what you call potential dominated yeah. environments and feedback dominated environments. In my mind, there should be an evolution between the potential dominated to feedback dominated. Do you see that? Um, I guess, yeah, I see what you mean. Because you'll get the, the feedback will then influence the surroundings. I guess what I'm more talking about is more like the initial state. Um, so the first um, are regions forming in environments which are more quiescent. Um, the ones which we call the kind of feedback dominated, they're formed in regions which have had recent um, feedback in their vicinity. Mm -hmm. And so this is more the differences in the initial state of the cloud into kind of the initial fragmentation and formation um, so, of the structures I'm talking about. So but the second obviously, kind... sorry. No, please, please. No, obviously, after you've had the, your massive clusters, which is formed and is potential dominated, 
the generation of star formation after it would be more feedback dominated, like any new clouds which form in the vicinity will be more feedback dominated, more like the second case. But in your simulations, you don't look for that evolution. There no. should be there, but no. you have to look for it. Yeah, this was done at a single snapshot in time. So using a population rather than tracing um, individual objects. So we trace the clouds for about two mega years. Um, but I think to really look at multiple generations um, of star formation, you would need at least um, 10 to 20 mega years. OK. So may, may I ask my second question? Or go back in the line. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, so you, you find in, in the, your, the last parts of your talk, you find that there is basically the same star formation rate in your in galaxies in when you measure it as a whole, even if the uh, morphology looks very different. Yes. So the, the, there should be some global properties of the galaxy that sets the star formation rate, not so much locally, the, uh, defined, but globally. Uh -huh. Would you yeah. agree with, with that? And what would you think that those parameters should be? Well, uh, the answer is I'm not sure yet because this is still um, work which I'm doing. But the, I can tell you the thing which was the same is was the same initial density distribution. Because um, mm -hmm. basically, we took the same model. And what we altered um, was the metallicity and the radiation environment. And what we're finding is that for when those things were proportional, the star formation um, was the same. And so it looks like it sets them by, you know, the total mass in the galaxy and the, the general density. Um, for Dick, I had to go a wee bit quick at the end because I wanted to get on to potential um, questions. Um, but there are other lines on this plot. You see the red and the blue ones are the um, are the field and the metallicity scale proportionally. Um, but you can see there are these other lines. Um, and that's this one here is where you have 1% um, metallicity and 10% UV field. And in that case, you have less star formation. And then if you look at the case um, where the metallicity is 10% and the field is 1% and then you have more star formation. And so the balance um, of those two things, the metallicity and the ambient radiation field, that can alter the star formation within the galaxy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Gilberto. We have, uh, so I just want to remind people, uh, our speaker needs to leave soon. So uh, I'll restrict that. <laughs> it's, my, it's my fault for talking too long. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so uh, next we have Roberto. Go ahead. Hi, Rowan. I will try to be uh, hi, um, just to be brief. Uh, maybe this is related to the work that we have pending with Jesus that is connected here. So, but um, can you give more details on how the the chemistry is implemented and if you only follow CO or also dust and uh, what are the relative abundances that you get? or you yeah. assume them? Can you give a little bit of detail? Yeah, so the, the dust treatment yeah. is just a constant dust, gas to um, dust ratio, so and which cool. you can set as a free parameter. Um, so for the solar metal is the case, we just obviously use the 1% um, right. dust to gas ratio. Um, for these low metallicity works, um, we, then, we scaled the um, gas to dust ratio according to the, the metallicity. In terms, yeah, so the, in terms of the chemistry, we have a couple yeah. of chemical networks. So all of the big galaxy simulations I showed, um, they used a simplified CO treatment from Simon Glover, where we follow the hydrogen chemistry, um, so H2 formation in detail. Um, but the CO is by a simplified approximation from Nelson and Langer. And that's been shown to work very well in the dense gas, but not quite so well in the diffuse gas. So, so in the dense gas, go ahead. dense gas, a uh, number density is a couple of hundred or higher. Okay. So within the clouds, it works well. Where it doesn't work so well is the cloud envelopes. So okay. for us, that didn't matter. Um, but this, the smaller dwarf galaxy, this uses a new network. 
um, based on the work of Gong et al. in 2017. And that has detailed um, carbon chemistry. So you form C1, um, CO, um, C plus in detail. Um, we fought with, as a byproduct of that, you get things like um, HCO plus. What yes. we don't have is the nitrogen chemistry. So you don't have HCN and all that? Uh, no, and, and HCN is a useful one too. Right, okay. So you would have to, you can use some kind of abundance post-processing. Uh, you know, you can say, okay, this is a typical abundance law for my densities if, to get an estimation of it. But we, we don't follow it properly um, as we do in the non equilibrium chemical network. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Roberto. We have a question from Enrique. Okay. Okay. Seems like I cannot start my video, but my my voice is on. <laughs> so, uh, the, so thanks, Rowan. Uh, very interesting. So, I, I would like to go back. Well, I have two uh, two brief things. One. So, uh, do I understand correctly that all your supernovae are randomly placed, or do the clustered ones? Uh, that, that's the major difference. This is. Yeah, the, the, the major difference between the two models is how the, the supernovae um, mm -hmm. are treated. So uh -huh. the one I call potential dominated, um, that's random supernova feedback. Okay. And that's why the potential dominates is because it acts as a kind of general mm -hmm. background to give you the right galactic turbulence, okay. basically. And mm -hmm. whereas the one which I call supernova, like that is clustered feedback. And mm -hmm. in that case, the supernovae are tied to the sinks and um, so we have um i don't have time to go into it and for the most for all the other galaxy simulations it's the same um so for the sinks we assume some star formation efficiency in this case the sinks represent small clusters okay we track the mass that goes in we calculate the number of massive stars um using a, obviously an assumed imf mm -hmm. and then we track the age of those stars and after an appropriate interval we start to detonate supernovae explosions um, we don't do this as a population we do each supernovae individually mm -hmm. so that after the first one goes you have cavity which then all the additional um, supernovae go into and that's quite important um, for getting the dynamics mm -hmm. right because obviously whether you have that cavity there or not um, just change how efficiently you can move the gas Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, because uh, then I would think, I would wonder uh, whether the um, the potential dominated model uh, is very realistic because I I would not expect uh, well I, you would always expect some correlation between the star formation activity and the feedback. Yeah, no? exactly. These are uh, this, one of the reasons why I call this a cloud factory. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> is because it's been as a test bed to basically test out different environments. I mean, this is, um, that, that's what it is. It's a numerical experiment, okay. basically. Mm -hmm. So look at the two limiting cases. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think um, reality will lie somewhere in between these and um, okay. with these two cases representing mm -hmm. the endpoints on the scale. Okay. Yeah. Well, and the the other question is uh, also very quick about your your uh, the thing you pointed out towards the end about the binding of the scale of the binding. Uh, you measure it uh, through the alpha parameter, but do you measure the alpha parameter just in terms of the uh, of the kinetic energy? Because one yes. one thing that we have been arguing uh, quite I, a lot is is that uh, it makes a lot of difference um, whether the velocity is pointing outwards or inwards, no? And, and... I would absolutely agree with that. And uh -huh. I think um, the project that um, Javier and I are working on um, uh -huh. with the student, um, Laura, um, uh -huh. is to exactly address that point. Okay. Um, so this, Robin did this for the entire population, but of uh -huh. course, as you guys have been championing for years, mm -hmm. <laughs> this might not be um, the best way of actually measuring the dynamical state. And as you said, if you're if you're if your velocities are pointing towards the center, then they're probably not supporting the gas. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, uh, so, 
hopefully the paper with Javier uh, and Laura will make that point quite elegantly. And they've got a nice new um, proper alpha part, um, alpha varial parameter where you actually take um, these things and the local tidal forces into account. Um, okay, but, perfect. Great, okay, thank you. Thanks, Enrique. Let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank Next you. Partner. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to talk. <laughs> okay, so I have a couple of questions, but then since you are running out of time, I'll, I'll be in touch with you. <laughs> that would be great. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.